It is good to be with you again tonight. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I would invite you to get in touch right away. Send me an email. Hopefully that is on the screen right now, the fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. If you have anything that we need to be praying for, any additions or corrections or updates to the bulletin, I would love to hear from you right away. If you are joining us by phone, my number is 608-224-0274. We can receive calls and texts on that number, so I would love to hear from you that way. If you have any corrections or updates, anything that we need to be praying about, I am in the garage, obviously, right now, in front of the woodpile again, and I'll just let you know it is getting a little bit warm out here, <laughs> and uh I'm not a fan of the warmth, uh, the, the heat of the summer. I love all seasons here in Wisconsin, but I just could not bear the thought of moving the studio <laughs> back inside. So I'm just uh, staying right where I am and enjoying the warmth, uh, the warm weather of a nice Wisconsin summer. And many things that are concerning to us right now, obviously, and yet there is some, some things that we're thankful for as well. Uh, but certainly in terms of our prayer concerns, we need to remember Jerry Turley. As of late last night, he was up in the hospital in Columbus. So let's remember Jerry in our prayers. Uh, Jim Baxter lost a good friend of his. I believe his name was Donnie. And so let's remember uh, Jim and uh, any family involved there and be praying for their comfort right now. Uh, of course, we just found out a little bit ago that one of our members was diagnosed, tested positive for the COVID-19. I don't want to share the name there without permission and certainly in this format right now, but let's be praying for that family. Um, I am personally thankful for, I guess, one byproduct of all of this. I am no longer paying $15 plus a $5 tip for a haircut. I think I got my second pandemic cut this week in the garage out here. So I am thankful for that. I'm enjoying a new shirt from one of my favorite thrift stores today. It's black, just like all the others. So it's a, just a beautiful shirt. Eddie Bauer thin and a nice uh, for the warm weather that we're experiencing right now. Covered in bits of flour. Just made homemade tortillas for my family for lunch today. It's been nice having a lot of us home for a good chunk of the time together. So we had some good homemade tortillas at our house today. And uh, one other personal update before we continue moving. I know Sunday I preached a, the third in a four-part series of lessons on Genesis chapter 3. We were talking about the curse and thorns and thistles being added to the creation at the time that Adam and Eve sinned. And I was out working in the garden on Monday. And I ended up with a bunch of thorns in my fingers. It was the, the, the barberry burst bushes I was working with and got to dig most of them out, but there is one still in there, and it is just tormenting me. And every time I just think, ah, Adam and Eve. So that, that the curse continues, but that we are thankful uh, for the blessings that we have and the ability to work outside and for the changing of the seasons. Just to review our schedule this week, please remember that we're having two worship services once again this coming Sunday at 9 a.m. and also at 10.30 a.m. That's to keep us under 25% capacity to give us plenty of space to spread out. We're keeping the windows open. Again, I know it's warm, but we're keeping the air moving through there as best we can so we can do the very best we can to meet safely. So please be sure to sign up for one of those two services if you are able to make it this weekend. If you need any help with that, please get in touch with either me or with Kenna, and we'd be glad to walk you through that process if you have trouble with that. Our plan is to continue the class in an online format only every Wednesday evening. This class will be online going forward, and then we'll continue online and at the building every Sunday, uh, just as we have been doing lately, perhaps making some adjustments going forward as needed. But please let me know if you have any questions, any concerns. And please be sure to sign up online. This would be a great time to do that, get that over with, so you don't forget it before this coming Sunday. Tonight, we get back into our study of the book of Luke. And in our class, I'll be referring once again to a book that I have recommended a number of times through the years, A Harmony of the Gospels by Robert Thomas and Stanley Gundry, usually on Amazon for about 25 bucks. If you don't have it yet, I'd be glad to help you with that if you need any help uh, getting it. But it is a valuable tool. By way of review, we know Luke was a Gentile, a second-generation Christian, we might say. He was not an eyewitness, but he researched what he wrote. He was a medical doctor. He writes the book of Luke and the book of Acts, and he focuses on chronological order. 
And he also makes a point of including a number of people groups who were often overlooked and sometimes oppressed in the ancient world, women and widows and Gentiles and Samaritans, as well as the sick. Last week, we looked at the first half of Luke chapter 9. Jesus sends out 12 apostles on something of a limited commission, not the Great Commission at the end of his earthly existence, but this is the limited commission, just a short-term mission trip. We then have the feeding of the 5,000. We have Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ. Uh, we have the transfiguration. And then we have the disciples failing to cast out a demon as Jesus is up there on the mountain. And so he comes down from the mountain and has to deal with the chaos of that scene. Tonight we pick up with Luke 9.46. And we hope to make it tonight through Luke 10, verse 24. So we're covering... Uh, half of two chapters. So basically a chapter tonight. Last week the chapter was rather long and chapter 10 is rather long as well, but I think we find a good cutoff point. So between Luke 9 verses 45 and 46, and so between last week and this week in chronological order, we have Jesus paying the temple tax in Matthew chapter 17, and that gets inserted right here. If you remember uh, there were some people concerned whether Jesus and his disciples were paying this, and so Jesus has Peter throw a hook into the sea, and he catches a fish, and he takes the coin out of its mouth, which was the perfect amount for paying that particular tax. So let's pick up tonight with Luke chapter 9, verse 46. This is Luke 9, verses 46 through 50. An argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. So in time sequence, this is perhaps very late summer, maybe very early fall of AD 29. Jesus is crucified in the spring of 30. And so we're eight to nine months out from the crucifixion, less than a year away before uh, the, the death of Jesus on the cross. So the difference between the fall of one year to the spring of the next. So this is not much time left, but even with less than a year left, the disciples are arguing once again about which one of them would be greatest in the kingdom. And this comes up a number of times, as you might remember. In Matthew, the disciples ask Jesus, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In Mark, Jesus is asking them what they're talking about, and they keep silence because they probably know that they shouldn't be talking about this yet again. And Luke describes this as an argument. And so they are just outright arguing, fighting among one another about which one might be the greatest. And to me, I'm thinking from Jesus' point of view, this would, would certainly be rather discouraging. Here he is, nine months away from his death, less than a year away from having these men out there completely on their own, and they are nowhere near ready. So he's been training them for almost three years now, and they're still arguing and not understanding this whole issue of which among them is the greatest. This seems to be a problem that he deals with over and over again. But to put an end to this, Jesus takes a child. And so there's a physical illustration. And he uses this child to make the point that those who are truly great in this life, those who are truly great in the kingdom in particular, are those who are willing to receive children in his name. And I know sometimes people eager to get ahead in life and to make a name for themselves are not really concerned about children. People who are always out there, you know, fighting to get to the top children are not a real concern for many people in that situation. They're, they're not a means to an end. Uh, remember, children can't do too much for us in terms of giving us power. They don't give to us. We have to give to them, generally speaking. Uh, children are not campaign donors, we might say, in our society today. Children can be used... Uh, as pawns without them fighting back. They are at a disadvantage. And remember, this is Luke's emphasis in his book. 
including those who are often overlooked or disadvantaged. And so Jesus in this passage lifts up children to a place of great honor. In Matthew, Jesus says that unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. In Mark, Jesus says, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And so there are some differences in Matthew, Mark, and Luke between these three accounts, but all make the same basic point. Instead of fighting for power, instead of striving for greatness as the world sees greatness, we need instead to be like little children. Not immature and whiny, not crying all the time, not, not that part of it, but humble. We need to be accepting. We need to be not only accepting ourselves, but we as adults need to be accepting of children. We need to be protecting children. We need to be lifting up children. Uh, unlike many people in the world who just walk on over children to, to get their way. We then come to a seemingly unrelated event. It doesn't really seem to follow here, but uh, John seems concerned that as they're out preaching on this limited commission, they ran into somebody casting out demons in the Lord's name, and they tried to stop him from doing that because he wasn't following along with them. And so this is John's objection, and he brings this to the Lord's attention. And the Lord responds, do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. Some have suggested that the point here is that anybody who claims to be religious in any way is good to go. We just need to leave them alone, let them do their own thing or whatever, and we just need to accept everybody. But I would point out the man they run into is actually casting out demons. He's doing something in the name of, by the authority of, with the approval of Jesus. He's not faking it, but he's actually doing the Lord's work. And John's issue is that John, he himself, is just not personally familiar with the man. He's not one of the twelve. And that was his objection. So we need to realize, though, that Jesus had other followers outside the twelve, didn't he? I mean, he's been preaching and teaching for three-plus years at this point. Uh, Jesus would often go off by himself to secluded places. The apostles had just been out on this limited commission, so Jesus was alone for some period of time, and I'm sure that he used that time to reach other people and to give them the power to do these, to do these miraculous things. And so there'd be no way for the twelve to know about everything and everybody, even as close to the Lord as they were. So good things were happening that they just didn't know about. Some have seen this as contradicting Matthew 12, verse 30, where Jesus says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. But we need to realize, though, that the man here in Luke 9 is actually with the Lord. He is on the Lord's team. He's on the Lord's side. He's doing miraculous things in Jesus' name. The issue here is simply John just doesn't know the man. John was ignorant. So the issue was not with the man. The issue was with John not knowing the man. So that kind of, I hope, helps explain what we've looked at here. Matthew and Mark continue with a warning to anyone who would cause one of these little children to stumble. It would be better for them to have a heavy millstone hung around their neck to be thrown into the sea with that connected. And in the harmony, we also have the passage from Matthew 18 where Jesus explains what we need to do when somebody sins against us. Um, we have the statement about forgiving people 70 times 7 and so on. So that is not included here in Luke, although it is in Matthew chapter 18, just putting this in time sequence. So we pick up now with Luke chapter 9, verse number 51. So the next paragraph is Luke 9. Let's look at Luke 9, verses 51 through 56. Luke 9, 51 through 56. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. In terms of the timing of this, John says that this is connected to the feast 
And when we put things in order, this seems to be a reference to the Feast of Tabernacles. John says that Jesus' brothers went to the feast, but he himself went as well, but in secret. Um, so back in verse 51, Jesus sets his face to go to Jerusalem. In other words, he is, he is now resolutely determined to start making his way to Jerusalem, ultimately for the crucifixion. This isn't his last trip to Jerusalem. I mean, he's going there and he's not going to stay there. He's going to leave and go in and out of that city a little bit. But he, he makes the decision that this is happening. This is the end is approaching. On his way, though, as he travels from up north to down near Jerusalem, south of where he was, he sends some messengers on ahead to make some travel arrangements in Samaria, kind of behind the scenes here. They didn't just show up places all the time. Sometimes they planned ahead, as the case is here. And when the people in Samaria find out that he's on his way to Jerusalem, they want nothing to do with him. Remember, Samaritans and Jews did not get along with each other. They had some serious racial tension between those two groups. As I understand it, the Samaritans were pretty much the remnant of the northern kingdom. They were Israelites who had intermarried then with the local people after they were basically wiped out by the Assyrian army. So the remainder of the survivors of the old ten tribes, the northern kingdom of Israel, had kind of come back here and there and had intermarried with the locals. So their ancestors had compromised, is the way that many of the Jewish people saw those in the north. And now they're showing animosity toward Jesus. Now one of the main reasons is, if you were passing through Samaria in order to get to Jerusalem for the purpose of worship, you were seen as rejecting the worship they saw as being acceptable right there in Samaria. So I hope we understand what that means. You're, you're passing their church to go to your church. It's kind of the way we would say today. And so you were dissing their religion if you were passing through Samaria to go to Jerusalem for the purpose of worship. You might have noticed that the Samaritans were actually in the news about a week ago, just over a week ago. The headline was, Samaritans greet the dawn atop their holiest mountain to mark Shavuot festival. That was the headline. So we have a picture on the screen here, if you're not able to see it, of a group of uh, men in these white robes. And so here is the story. I'll read the first few paragraphs just because this is current events. We're dealing with Samaritans even today. Here's the story. Members of the Samaritan faith, which is closely linked to Judaism, gathered at sunrise on Sunday atop their religion's holiest mountain in the northern West Bank, marking the Shavuot festival with a special prayer in ancient Samaritan Hebrew using a Torah scroll. The Samaritan community members uh, numbers around 820 people. So that's by the way, this is my comment here. There, there are only 820 Samaritans in the world today, at least according to this article, many of whom live high above the Palestinian city of Nablus on Mount Gerizim, which they regard as the true chosen place rather than Jerusalem's Mount Zion, revered by the Jewish faithful. Known for their appearance in the parable of the Good Samaritan in the Christian Bible. This is coming next week in our study. Samaritans are a special case in the complicated ethnic and religious fabric of the West Bank. The Samaritans consider themselves the descendants of the Israelites from the ancient kingdom of Israel in biblical times. They believe their ancestors escaped exile under the Assyrians in the 8th century BC and that they alone kept alive the traditions of the Jewish people. They claim the kingdom of Judah, which went on to become what is we know today as the Jewish people, while exiled in Babylon, moved away from those original traditions. So just a note from Baxter here, not reading from the story. The feeling is mutual. Remember how I said the Jews thought of the Samaritans as being the compromisers? Well, here we read on this 2,000 years later, the Samaritans see the Jewish people as being the compromisers. When they were pulled away to Babylon, they left the true faith, and the Samaritans are the only ones left. So I'll go back to the story here. According to the British former diplomat and historian Gerard Russell in his book, Heirs to Forgotten Kingdoms, the Samaritans saw themselves as keeping to the letter of the ancient traditions that their southern neighbors, the Jews, had abandoned. 
and had a history of persistent conflict with them. All right, so that's a story from the newspaper over there just about a week and a half ago. So Samaritans in the news. So these are the Samaritans. And so when James and John hear that the Samaritans didn't want Jesus and his disciples passing through or staying in that area, notice how they responded. They offered to be agents of destruction. You know, they wanted Jesus, just give the word. We want to burn them with fire, Lord. You know, let us let us have it. You know, let us have the privilege of, of burning these cities. They wanted to call down fire from heaven to consume any city of the Samaritans that would dare reject Jesus. Remember last week we had Jesus taking something of an opinion poll among his apostles. And, you know, who do people say that I am? And some people had suggested that Jesus was really Elijah come back from the dead. So thinking about Elijah, didn't Elijah have a habit of calling down fire from heaven a time or two? You know, they've got Elijah on the brain is the way I'm looking at this. We have the contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18. Remember where they poured water on the, you know, on the firewood and the sacrifice, and then this you know, fire came down from heaven and consumed everything. So we've got that. And then we also have Elijah calling down fire from heaven to destroy the captains and the armies that were sent by the king in 2 Kings chapter 1. And so Elijah is here in recent history in their discussions between Jesus and the apostles. So James and John then probably thought that they were suggesting something good here. They thought they were saying something that Jesus would be proud of. They're probably expecting some congratulations from Jesus. Yes, exactly. Good job. I am a lot like Elijah. Let's burn him. Jesus, though, doesn't say that, does he? He rebukes them. Some of you might notice that you have brackets in a couple of these verses here near the end, or maybe a blank spot, or maybe you have something that's missing from what I just read a few moments ago. We have a few lines that are not found in many of the ancient manuscripts, and so there is some controversy over exactly what words need to be in the text here. Uh, but I think the point is, regardless of what's in there and what's not, even with those two lines taken out in the brackets, Jesus definitely does not want fire to come down from heaven uh, due to a lack of hospitality on their part. He did not come to destroy people. He came here to save people. Instead, they simply they go and they move on to another village. All right, let's keep moving then. Look at uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62 is the next paragraph. Luke 9, 57 through 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. In Matthew, we learn that this someone up at the beginning is a scribe. That's something I don't think we find here in Luke. The scribes were those who copied the law of Moses by hand, and so they were absolute experts in the law. And we can imagine today, if your job was to make handwritten copies of the Bible for your 30 or 40 year career for the rest of your life, you would also be an expert in the Bible if we had our, as our job, as our mission in life, copying it by hand. And so people look to them for advice. If they're like, what is some weird verse I can't remember? Well, ask a scribe. They'll know. They do this all the time. And so this scribe comes up and he offers to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Many religious leaders, of course, would be happy to have another potential follower. Yes, come on, join and, and be with me here. But Jesus, though, almost seems as if he's trying to talk him out of it, doesn't he? He doesn't just welcome him on board, but he makes sure that this man knows that he personally is homeless. Do you know what you are getting yourself into here? And so it comes across almost as a warning. If, if you want to follow Jesus, go into it knowing that this is a possibility. Our Lord was homeless. And that is a possibility for us as well. Most of us appreciate that Jesus never tried to trick people into being his followers. He never sugarcoated it. 
He never told them it was going to be better than it was, but he always told them the truth. He made sure that people were well informed, and it seems that we would do well to do the same today. Not telling people, oh, just be a Christian. It's the easy life. You know, that's not the right thing that we need to be doing. We need to make sure that people are informed of the difficulties as well as the blessings of the Christian faith. We then have a series of similar encounters along the way, some instigated by Jesus, some instigated by others. As Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem to be crucified, people see this traveling band of followers. Sometimes they offer to join in. Sometimes Jesus is the one saying, follow me. One of these men wants to bury his own father. And some have kind of, spec not speculated, but just tried to understand this. That doesn't make sense. If his father had just died, you would think that he would be with his family instead of here out in the wilderness following Jesus. So I guess some of the speculation is perhaps his father had not died yet. And so the idea is, let me bury my father in that. Let me go and spend the last few years with my father before he dies so that I can bury him. I'm saying that's at least one possible explanation. I mean, it seems rather heartless if this man's father had just died earlier that morning for Jesus to say no. Not that Jesus would or wouldn't say that. I'm just explaining that there is another possible explanation that this man might have been saying, I will join you in a few years. Uh, if that's the case, we certainly understand why Jesus says what he says here. So Jesus seems to explain, no, this is a once in a lifetime, limited time offer. And so as I'm seeing it, he's saying, allow those who are spiritually dead to bury the physically dead. Do what you need to do spiritually, and the world will take care of the world. This man needs to go and preach the gospel right now. Somebody else wants to say goodbye to his family, but again, Jesus objects. If you put your hand to the plow and keep on looking back, if you're always regretting your past life, this is not the journey that you want to be making. This is not for you. This is a one-way journey to the cross. Remember, we studied a week or two. You must deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. This is not a life where you can always be looking back with regret. This is a one-way trip. In the harmony, we then, at this point, would insert most of John chapter 7 and 8. As Jesus teaches in Jerusalem for the Feast of the Tabernacles, this is where the Pharisees send officers to arrest Jesus. Remember that? But they can't do it. They go and they listen. And they come back with the explanation, never did a man speak the way this man speaks. Imagine that happening today. An arrest warrant is issued. The officers go. They see the man that they're looking for. And they hear him talk for a while and go back to headquarters and say, no, we just couldn't do it. That, that man's a talker. We don't see that today. And that was unusual back then. And so the officers came back empty-handed. That gets inserted here. We also have the woman caught in the very act of adultery where Jesus writes in the dirt a couple times and then sends her away. From now on, sin no more. That gets inserted here chronologically. We have the scene from the end of John 8 where they pick up the stones to throw at Jesus, which is interesting to me. The first part of John 8, he is defending a woman from getting stoned, and by the end of the chapter, they're picking up those stones to throw at him, not the woman. But he hides himself and he escapes. And this brings us to what comes next. And this is Luke chapter 10. Let's look at Luke 10, verses 1 through 16. Luke 10, 1 through 16. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, but if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages." Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you and heal those in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your city, which clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. 
I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. The one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Notice now, instead of sending out just the twelve, now Jesus sends out seventy. And it's interesting to me that he sent them on ahead of where he is going. And so they are to break the ground, maybe introduce the Lord ahead of time, be looking for Jesus who is coming. Notice also he sends these men out by pairs. If we were together, we might talk about the wisdom of going out two by two instead of uh, teaching alone. Alone, these people would obviously cover more ground. But there are some advantages to preaching and teaching with a partner. Obviously, if you get into trouble, you have backup in a discussion. One person will often lead. The other person is there for support, maybe to find a Bible reference from time to time. And so there are some advantages to going out in pairs. I know whenever we go door to door in Madison, whenever we have groups come to help us go door to door, that's one thing we always emphasize. We do not go door to door in Madison alone. We always go with somebody else in groups of at least two. So we're now in the fall of AD 29, and the reason for this outreach is because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so there's too much ground for Jesus and the 12 to cover by themselves. Therefore, Jesus delegates. He delegates beyond the 12 to 70. As to the significance of the number 70, maybe it's significant, maybe not. You might remember that there were 70 who came up to Egypt due to the famine. That's referred to in Exodus chapter 1. We also know that Moses appointed 70 elders to help him lead the people back in Exodus 24. And so there might have been some parallel here where Jesus was pulling a Moses. And people would think, hmm, Jesus has these 70 people. Moses had 70 people. That might have helped them to make that connection. Maybe, maybe not. Only this time, instead of leading, he is sending these people out as lambs in the midst of wolves seems to me this is a warning to these people that their message will not be accepted. Remember, you're in enemy territory. Not because we hate them, but they hate you. You are not welcome in many of these places. Don't make yourselves at home here. We're just passing through. And similar to the instructions given to just the apostles earlier, they're not supposed to pack for this trip, are they? Basically, don't take anything. This isn't a vacation. This isn't a trip for socializing. But these people are on a very focused, very important, critical mission. If they're accepted, great. If they're rejected, they just need to keep on going. In verse 7, Jesus explains that those who are teaching are to rely on those who are taught to supply their needs. And so they don't have a money bag full of money to go sponsor this trip. They are just to go and preach. And the ones who hear their preaching and teaching are the ones who are to support them. The laborer is worthy of his wages. This is a concept going back all the way to the law of Moses. In addition to teaching, he also gives these people the ability to heal. And if they are rejected, they are to shake the dust off of their feet in protest, and they are to move on. He pronounces some woe on these unbelieving cities, and as he does so, notice how Luke includes this praise for Tyre and Sidon. Remember, these are Gentile cities, and remember Luke's emphasis on Gentiles and outsiders. So if the people in Tyre and Sidon had seen what the people in Chorazin and Bethsaida had seen, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. In verse 14, we have some hint concerning degrees of punishment. Some people ask about that from time to time. Will there be degrees of punishment in hell? in torment. And it seems that people in both cities would be lost in the end, but it would be more tolerable for some than for others. Whether that is some physical thing, whether that is the mental anguish of having been so close, we don't know. It, the Bible leaves that open. In verse 16, we have a word of encouragement for these 70 who are being sent out. Basically, if people reject you, do not take it personally. When they reject you, they're actually rejecting me, Jesus says. And when they reject Jesus, they're actually rejecting the one who sent Jesus. And I'm obviously assuming this refers to the Father. And so his message is, do not get discouraged. 
We now move on to the reports that start coming back from these 70 being sent out. So let's move ahead to Luke 10, 17 through 24. This will be our last paragraph tonight. Luke 10, verses 17 through 24. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see, for I say to you that many prophets and kings wished to see these things which you see, and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear. And did not hear them. So the 70 come back, they give a report, and to me, I don't know about with you, but to me it almost seems that they're a little bit surprised at the beginning. Even the demons are subject to your name. They are shocked by this and pretty excited about it. Jesus explains that he was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Obviously there's been quite a bit of discussion on this. Is this a description of the origin of Satan? Or is this something else? Or is it some mixture of multiple things? I don't know what's going on. But in context, it seems uh, the most obvious explanation is this is figurative in some way. It's somehow tied to the 70 casting out demons. And so as they go out and cast out demons, Jesus, in a sense, pictures Satan as falling from heaven. Satan is getting damaged. He is being controlled. He's being cast out. He's being humiliated. In verse 19, they have other miraculous powers, and it would be very easy to be impressed by all of this. Wow, look at what we can do. But Jesus explains the real blessing is not the miraculous power. The real blessing is that their names are written in heaven. And I would suggest here before we close tonight, the same thing goes for us. Let's not get discouraged that we don't have the same miraculous powers that they had. I know a lot of people today try to emphasize the miraculous ability. You've got to have this or that or have these abilities or you're not a real Christian? No, instead, let's rejoice that our names are written in heaven. That's the main point. If our names are written in heaven, nothing else matters in this life. Starting in verse 21, it is not described as a prayer, but Jesus rejoices in the Holy Spirit and he speaks to his Father. Notice this prayer or statement of praise, however we want to look at that, starts with a statement of praise. We've mentioned this regularly, that our prayers should probably or could probably use more praise than we are accustomed to. It's always good to praise God. Instead of only asking God for stuff, the Bible seems to emphasize an attitude of praise in our prayers. And this is what Jesus does here. He leads the way on this. And in this statement to his father, the Lord seems to be amazed at the faith of the 70 that he sent out. He's uh, comforted by that. He's impressed by it. These are simple people, but they get it. They understand even when the more intelligent people of the world seem to be missing it. And generally speaking, this is still true today. Generally speaking, God's people, we are not well-educated. We are not powerful politically. We are not wealthy. But instead, generally speaking, we are common. We are regular, everyday people. Christians are. I mean, we do have some wealthy and powerful here and there, but by and large, we are simple people. We are infants as Jesus describes us here. Again, we are like children. That is our mission. We want to be like children. This is not derogatory for us. In verse 22, Jesus explains in this statement of praise that he is the one who reveals who he is, and that's why he's teaching and preaching. His goal is to reveal himself to anybody and everybody who's willing to accept it. And obviously, generally, the poor are more willing to accept it. In verses 23 and 24, we find Jesus speaks to his disciples privately a little bit later, pulls them aside after this, and tries to emphasize how blessed they are to know these things. 
there are many kings, many prophets from the past who longed to see what they see and have longed to hear what they hear, but they were not able. And so he's telling them, I believe, to be thankful. You need to appreciate this time in which you are living. And here we are, nearly 2,000 years later, we have the ability to read and to study and to meditate on these things. It is truly just an awesome blessing to be able to study the Bible tonight. And this brings us to the end for tonight. Next week, we hope to jump in just in time for the parable of the Good Samaritan. So I hope you'll be ready for that next Wednesday, Lord willing. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Make sure to send me any prayer requests to the number on the screen or to the email there. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, next week, come prepared by reading Luke 10, 25 through chapter 11, verse 28 before class. So we're covering a chapter, but in half. So half of chapter 10 and the first half of chapter 11. Again, you might also want to look at this in the Harmony of the Gospels. If you have any trouble, you want to find that book, but you can't, uh, let me know and I'd be glad to help you with that. Let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as the great God who defines greatness by holding up small children as examples. We pray that as we interact with the world for the rest of this week, that we would be humble and trusting. We're thankful for the great privilege that you've given us in preaching the good news of your kingdom to the world around us. Help us to appreciate that blessing. Help us to take it seriously. People we know and love are hurting right now. We pray tonight for Jerry Turley and for the struggles that he's having right now. We pray for Tim, Abe's friend, as he comes to the end of his struggle with cancer. We pray that you would be with him and those who are watching over him. We pray for our city right now. We're in difficult times for a number of reasons where we live. We pray for justice and we certainly pray for peace so that we would be able to continue coming together as your people. We're thankful tonight that our names are written in your book. We pray that we might be able to do good. Thank you for the resources that you have provided to us. Today we pray for opportunities to help others in your name. We come to you with these requests in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.